Okay, today we're talking about distances and clustering, and as a, an example, we're going to use data from genotyping arrays. All right, so let's start with clustering. So to understand clustering, we first have to understand the mathematical definition of distance. All right, so clustering is actually a, a very uh, a colloquial term that we use. We cluster animals into groups like birds and fish and um, insects and we do it by visually and, and other other things like that but um, how do we actually do it with numbers with math that's, that's what we're gonna do right so what we do when we cluster is we we put things that are close together into groups but we have to define close so let's use for uh, for now let's use a uh, gene expression so what does it mean uh, for two genes to be close uh, what does it mean for two samples uh, to be close? And now once we know this, once we know what's close and what's not close, then we can define groups. So in my opinion, the, the more the, in hard, the harder part and the more important part of clustering is really uh, the part where we define distances. All right, so let's, so what is distance? So this is a very simple figure. This is Baltimore and DC and we want to compute the distance between those two points in, in, on Earth we can um, simply drive from here to there and just write down how much it took or or if we know the longitude and latitude which is represented with X and Y here you can actually calculate it by using um, this very simple and well-known formula um, okay so that's how we compute distance between two points in a two-dimensional space. Very simple, right? We, we know this. This is called Euclidean distance, and you should remember this from your geometry class in high school. Now, what about when we have 20,000 genes? If we have more than two, um, two dimensions for our points, right? So here, Baltimore and DC are points, and they're defined by two numbers. They're two-dimensional points. We could have three-dimensional points in, in space, but once we go beyond that, it becomes an abstract, uh, an abstract concept. So, for example, if we have uh, 26 dimensions, we really can't visualize that, but we can still define distance just using the same formula, basically. So it's just the same formula, and this gives us distance between two points in 26-dimensional space. When we talk about things like gene expression, we can have a point sample of an individual uh, would be a tw could be as big as much as a twenty thousand dimensional point. So the distance between two people is the uh, needs. We need a way to define distance between them by um, taking this formula, summing over all twenty thousand gene expression values. All right. So if we do that, if we can. If we use Euclidean distance, for example, we can take get data. Here's this is real data. Get this data from Geo. We have brains, we have kidney, liver, and um, endometrium, and hippocampus. So what we're done here is we've taken these gene expression values, which are very simple. You have um, twenty thousand numbers for each sample. We compute a clean distance between each pair. Once we have the distance, then we can put them together. This, in this particular figure, we use something we're going to describe later called hierarchical clustering to put them together. But the point is, we we have in fact computed distances between samples, and here's um, a plot showing how far apart they are. All right. Um, now we can also we also see these dendrograms showing samples that are close together in heat maps and in a heat map you you cluster this is a heat map for gene expression you cluster the genes uh, first uh, it doesn't matter the order but you cluster genes here and then you cluster samples you order them by by wh wh which samples is close to which and which gene is close to which and then you make a plot showing co with color the actual measurement. So this is the same data as before, but now we're showing clusters and we're also showing 
uh, the values, the expression values for each uh, gene at each sample. And in this picture, we can see a, a clear division between the brain part and the other um, tissues. Although here's an outlier, there's a kidney in here, and there is a. Yep, oh, that's it. Okay. All right, moving on. So, uh, one very nice plot to make to visualize this. So, there's the dendrogram, which shows things that are close together physically next in. in, in in, in the um, tree, in, in a tree structure. Multi-dimensional scaling actually is something I actually prefer over dendrograms. We'll show you a two-dimensional approximation of the data that preserves the distances. So here are this, this is the same data that I showed before. Uh, each point is a sample and what I've done is I I ran MDS in R and I have reduce the 20,000 dimensions into two. That's how, I, that's how I'm able to plot it in two dimensions. So I have some linear combination of gene expression he, here and another one here. And the, the important part is that the, the distance between points is approximated to the real distance. So I can say, for example, that this sample and this sample are closer together than this sample and that sample. Remember, I'm only looking at two dimensions and there's really 20,000. But again, it's a really nice mathematical trick based on ideas similar to principal component analysis that uh, can, can permit you to make a plot like this. A, very, a related plot that is very, very similar to this one and in some instances is actually exactly the same is to do a principal component analysis and plot the first two principal components against each other. And you would get a picture like this. All right. So I'm going to give a very quick example of how clustering can be useful. And I'm going to use genotyping data to do that. OK, so genotyping is used to uh, learn about, explain, genotypes explain, different genotypes explain a lot of human variation, these, these SNPs uh, that are in, the, in our genome that are different across different populations. And what is a SNP? It's if you in our gene, our genome. So the genome of two human individuals are going to be all very similar. They're similar up to 99.9 percent. .9%, but there's going to be one out of every hundred, one out of every 300. I don't know what the current estimate is. Of the bases in our genomes are different, and we have one population might have one base and another might have another, and these are what we call single nucleotide polymorphisms. So you can have three possibilities. There's, there's, um, here's the AA genotype where you got an A and an A, an A from your mom and an A from your dad. There's the AG genotype, get an A from your mom, a G from your dad, and a GG genotype where you get G from both your mom and your dad. So um, these SNPs are something that are, are studied in particular in, in disease because if we want to if we want to find if there's if we don't know if there's a genetic cause for a disease and we want to find if if this, people that have the disease and people who don't have the disease differ some way in their genomes we don't need necessarily to look at the entire genome it's hard that's hard and expensive to do but we could instead measure their genotypes at SNPs only. So we're looking, we're focusing on locations of the genome known to vary across populations and searching for differences among that subset of the genome. So it's easier because instead of three billion bases, we look at a million or so. This, the, the, mo the most recent technology, you can measure mi a million SNPs at a time. You can genotype an individual at a million SNPs uh, it, it, at, at the same time. So in the the way this is done, it's done with microarrays. Now we're also using next generation sequencing. With microarrays you have uh, two probes and what you want to do is with these probes you want to figure out if an individual at a specific SNP has uh, a, a G, which of the three genotypes this individual has. So to do that you have a probe for the A, in this case, this is an F SNP that's a, either A or G. So you have a probe for the A, right? So this is a 
this is a comp complementary sequence to this sequence if there's an A, right? So the T matches the A, and then you have a second probe that matches the the a DNA if there's a G. All right, now, so then we we can collect data from this, and it'll look something like this. So you have um, two probes. That's why we have two um, two axes, and we have uh, three clear genotypes. So this is the A probe. Therefore, this these this group here has high A and very low B. So this is the AA group. This here, this one has low A and high B. So it's the BB group. This is basically zero, except there's 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 background noise, so it's it actually gets pushed up to some number. And then this is the AB genotype. The colors here are actually coming from, from annotation because this is a, a gene, this is a population, this is a population that has already been genotyped with another technology, it's the hat map population. These are 270 circles, 270 hat map individuals. And in this particular SNP, we already know what the genotype is and that's what the color is. So the point is that the, the data from the array is matching the known genotypes very well. Right? So we can have, one, one trick we can use is we can say, well, we're going to create these little circles and define if something falls in that circle then we're going to call it an AA if it falls in this circle an AB this circle a BB right, so we can use those regions to decide what genotype it is so that's so this is one snip but now let's look at another snip remember these arrays have millions of snips so if we look at another one now it, they don't. You can see the three genotypes, but they don't fall in the in the predefined regions we 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 defined for the previous SNP. We look at another SNP. Again, very different. The, 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 you can see the three genotypes, but we they're not falling in the predefined regions. And here's another one. Uh, this is basically due to the probe effect, which we're going to talk about in another lecture. But the point is, we can We need to find. We need to redefine regions for every single genotype. And one way to do that is to use a clustering algorithm that automatically finds the three groups. There's another SNP that's particularly troublesome. Alright, so first the first thing we're going to do to to, 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 um, to, to to define a useful um, clustering algorithm, you're going to do this, is, is you're, you're going to notice that most of the information here is in this direction. So if you do an MA plot transformation, you get a, a plot like that, and you um, you can do pretty well if you try to cluster based on the log ratio of the two values. So here's here's a, a SNP, and we're going to maybe define these cutoffs. So if you're near zero, you're an AB. If you're near two, you're an AA. If you're near minus two, you're a BB. So that works pretty well for several of the SNPs, but um, not always. And now, the, the, now what we want to do is use a clustering algorithm to automatically genotype these points without knowledge of what genotype there is. They, they are. So one, one thing we can do is use something called k-mean clustering. So I'm going to explain this one. This is a very simple clustering algorithm. It's widely used. So I'll explain it briefly. So we are we start with it. There's the data. We have obviously three clusters. To our eyes, it's very obvious, just like for the genotype that we were looking at. It was very obvious, right? But remember, for the, for the SNPs, you have to do this a million times. So even though by it's easy to do by eye, you can't do it by eye a million times. You need an automatic way to do it. That's where the clustering is going to become useful. So how do we get a computer to notice that there's three groups? So here's what... Um, K means does, and I'm using here an example, assuming this is like a gene expression example, but it could also be a genotype example. So we uh, define, we're going we're gonna to we're gonna have to define how many clusters we think there are, that's what the K is for. So in this case, K, K stands for the number of groups. In a genotype example, we would, if we think there's three genotypes, then we say, okay, well, K is three. So once you define that there's three groups, then you assign starting values for the three uh, centers of the three groups. These are called the centroids. 
Now, how do you do that? There's different approaches. You can pick at ran You can pick three points at random. You can pre. You can this. You can have as a user of software that does clustering. You can define the three centers. Uh, once you define the three centers, I th those are our starting values. Now, here's where the distance part com comes up. Remember, we we started the lecture talking about distance. So for any clustering algorithm, we have to have distance defined. So now. For each point, we're going to classify it to the cluster for which the centroid is closest. So we compute the distance between each point and each centroid, and now we classify them this way, right? So these four were closest to, to this center, these three were closest to this center, and these seven were closer to this center. So this is not a great so, uh, uh, result. It's terrible, actually, but k-means actually iterates and now in the next step we're going to redefine the centroids based on the current estimate of of what what point goes in which cluster so we take the center of the browns the center of the reds and the center of the greens and now the centers move like this once we've done that now we recompute the membership based on distance and now um, it looks like this and we're actually done in three iterations we have a pretty nice solution so that's k means it's a really good clustering algorithm, really simple, really easy to understand. Um, I use it very often. Okay, now, we started the lecture with a dendrogram, and that's something you don't get out of the k-means uh, algorithm. You don't get, you know, heat maps and things like that use dendrograms. K-means does not produce that. K-means, at the end, what you get is for each individual mesh, um, sample, you get a... Um, a membership so you, you, you say which cluster it's in also it's in there are cases where we we need to choose K we don't know what K is so th there are approaches that have been published on how to choose K but there's no there's no guaranteed way of picking the right at K automatically with a computer with, with an algorithm so there's another uh, uh, there's several clustering algorithms I'm, I'm actually just talking about two K means, but there, there's two very clear distinctions: the the algorithms like K means, and then there's the algorithms like hierarchical clustering. So in hierarchical clustering, what we do, there, you can do this. There's two approaches: we can do it top down or bottom up. And the idea is that in 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 one of these cases, you will find um, you, you take all all the samples and you divide them into two. And then you divide each one of those groups into two, and then you divide each one of those two into group into two until you have reached into two groups, not equal, not equal size, just two groups. And then you stop when you when you don't have any more to divide. And again, how 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 does distance come into this? Because we we divide groups by how close they are. So th there's 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 a k-means function in R. There's also an h-clust function in R. These are easy to use and, 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 and very fast, very efficient. So when we're done, we, we get a picture like this. So the, the dendrogram, now that these divisions occur, and then we, to display the divisions, we can, we can show them in a dendrogram. So here the first split took this sample on one side and all the rest on another. Then in the next split, it put these three on one side and all the rest on the other. Then on this split, these groups got here, etc. So, right, so you keep going until you, you, you have nothing more to split. And the way that, that we interpret this, the way we can decide, the way we can um, know how far apart two samples are, we, the way we do that is we go back and see where they split. So for example, S10 and S17, how far are those two? They're this far, right? So this height, that's the distance between those two. S2 and S3, they're very close, they're this far, they're this far apart. Now, a very important point about dendrograms, interpreting dendrograms, is that the within a group, the orientation left to right of the samples is, is arbitrary. So these two can, can, can be switched, and it's the same dendrogram. It's like a mobile. Similarly, this, every single split can turn. Oops, sorry. So th the consequence of that is that, for example, S10 and S1, which are right next to each other, well, let's take this as a better example. S17 and S6, right? They're, not, they're next to each other. So does that mean they're close? 
They're not close at all. They are very far apart. How far apart are these two? They have to go all the way up here for the split. So don't be confused by thinking that things that are that this order means anything. It doesn't. You, if you want to know the distance between two points, you have to go back to where they split. Okay. Okay. So, um, how do we form the actual clusters? If we, this is, I just said, it's clustering algorithm. This is just the splitting of the of the samples into into groups of two. To form actual clusters, we have to decide on a height where we cut. So here, I can say, okay cut at 10.25 and if I do that I'm gonna get um, one three clusters this one this one and this one over here this whole uh, group over here and if I cut down here I get more groups right I get one two three four five etc right so so this you're basically saying anything that is this close apart gets put into the same group right? so all these samples are closer than this to each other so they all get put into one cluster so here's that can really change what gets put together right if I if I in here in this example with the actual tissues if I if I um, cut here what groups do I have I have this group which appears to be the brain cerebellum and hippocampus and this group which appears to be other stuff and there's here a hippocampus which is probably an outlier or a cerebellum these guys might be bad bad um, arrays now if I cut down here then the cerebellums cluster together the, the hippocampus cluster together except this guy um, and then there's there's the livers are all on their own so you get a little bit more sp specificity um, and sensitivity when, when it comes to the distinguishing tissues okay now one last very important note distance is very susceptible to noise very susceptible so in, in, a, in something like gene expression uh, I, I, with, this is illustrated with a with a simulation just so to give you the sense of how susceptible to noise these things are so here is this data was created by taking 450 um, genes that we, sorry a total of 900 genes of which 450 were distinguished the groups they were different in each group and 450 genes were just noise over on this side it's just the, the 450 that are actually difference between the groups and when we when we have that then you get perfect clustering right if you, if you draw the split here you get perfect clustering all the reds together all the purple together etc now just by adding 450 noisy genes genes that don't have nothing to do with with uh, cl class membership you get um, you get a lot of mistakes now imagine if you add 20,000 noisy genes to the 450 relevant genes and this thing starts um, looking not very good so one of the things that I have learned by analyzing data is that when you have a, a data set where the the uh, outcome is something that you're not really expecting to have too many genes that are differentially expressed, so, so like um, a, a disease, autistic brains and normal brains, something like that. If you see perfect clustering, instead of getting excited because you think you can d distinguish autism from non-autism with expression, you should get worried that you have not introduced some kind of some kind of artifact that divides them because rarely is the biology strong enough to create perfect clustering. We see it with tissues, we see it with cancer normal sometimes, but other phenotype variability rarely splits data in when we use clustering into perfect groups. If you if you want to do something like prediction, there's other approaches called you know some supervised learning approaches that work much better. Okay, and that's the end of this lecture.